All right. Good morning. Happy Monday. Here we are, 22 March. Uh, homework six due tonight. P3 was moved, the due date was moved from Friday to tonight, so both of those are due tonight. And um, this is our last lecture session. So I suspect we'll get through the entire module today. And what I'll do the rest of the semester is keep holding these times open as office hours. When we get down to here, P4, P5, P6, these are intermediate code drops. So basically take the code that you've written so far on your project, turn it in, and um, the only way you get credit for it, it's a small, a small amount for each one, but the only way you get credit for it is to do demonstrations. Um, I tried to do the grading of P2 by myself and you saw how poorly that went. So uh, it just took way too much time. So I am unleashing the TAs also um, uh, to help you with these. So you can demonstrate to me or one of the TAs and you can do it during this time. You can do it during office hours, three to five. You can set up your own times with myself or a, um, uh, or a TA but uh, you have to show the code. Uh, what we found in the past is that uh, it takes about 10 minutes or so. And what we found in the past is that you get uh, a lot of good information guidance. We can get a lot of help done in a, in a, in a short, short period of time. Uh, there's really nothing better than just the one-on-one -on -one interaction, I think, for helping you clarify what's going on with your code, what, what works right, what isn't working right, what looks like bad design, what would serve as a better design. So that's what the rest of the semester looks like. So you're, you've gotten a little less time commitment now uh, for the required things. Uh, uh, you are never required to attend this lecture, but if you regularly attended, you just picked up six hours a week. Um, and, um, so that's from, from here on out. Even the project discussions on Fridays will be just open-ended. You wanna come in, show me your code. Uh, we can talk about it and talk about what's working and what's not. Uh, this week is also the last lab. So after this, the lab times are all uh, devoted to tutorials and or product demonstrations. So again, the, the, the whole goal is we want April to be uh, mo mostly free of commitments so that you can uh, focus on your project and you have time to get it done. And uh, again, that's why scaling the project appropriately is a helpful thing. So you know, most people are gonna get this done in April uh, because we allow this extra time. So that's where we're heading. Uh, for the topic, we'll talk about the, this is a short slide deck, uh, talk about the topics and um, uh, then do the uh, code demonstrations. All right, as always, make sure that you understand these things at the end of the semester. I recommend making some really stupid, simple classes from scratch. Um, there's a half hour exercise and convince yourself that you can do a classes and interfaces topic of the topic of the week here. All right, so what are these things? What are abstract classes and what are interfaces? Well, we have to start at the method level. An abstract method is nothing more than having the signature of the method. Remember, the signature is the return type, the name, and the input parameter list. Having the signature of the method with no definition of the method does. In other words, there's no code in the body of the message. In fact, you know, you know, it's always um, public return type, name, parameter list, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. You don't even put the curly brackets in. In order to do that, you have to tell the compiler, hey, I'm not going to put any body in here because normally the, the compiler will see public, return type, name, parameter list, and then the next thing it's looking for is open curly bracket. And you have to tell it to, to not expect that. So you use the keyword abstract. 
So public abstract double foo, public, everybody can see it, abstract, it's an abstract class, so there's not gonna be any definition for it. Double is its return type, foo is its name, it has no uh, input parameters. And because you put abstract in there, the compiler will stop there. It, after that closing semicolon, instead of looking for open curly bracket, it looks for the semicolon to, to end the line. Why do we use these? Well, some of you guys had already gotten here a few weeks ago. Remember, we, I'm encouraging you, we, you know, when for your inheritance, you have a generic class and then you extend that generic class to the specifics. So in the sheep sheepdog game, we had a generic animal and then we extended that to the sheepdog and we extended that to the sheep. And in the game, we never created a generic animal. And that's really the right way to use inheritance. You, you never create an instance of that parent class. Uh, in my never ending ship example, you have the idea of a generic ship and then you can extend that for you know, tugboats, container ships, tanker ships, cruise liners, and you never create a generic ship. And what we said was in the case of having the uh, the methods in that top level generic class, so far what we've been doing is defining the, method, the, the methods. We've been putting actual code in there. Knowing that it was wrong, when we did the uh, geometry samples, we had generic shape and then we extended it to a circle and we ex extended it to a square and we extended it to a rectangle and that generic shape, we had a area, right, calculate area method. And of course you can't calculate the area of a generic shape. Once you extend it to circle, then you can. Once you extend it to square or rectangle, then you can. And the same with calculate perimeter. You can't do it for the generic shape. And at that time, some people said, well, why are we even putting that in there? If you can't define it, if you know it's gonna be wrong, why would you even put it in there? And so here's a way that you put it in there in a way that makes the most sense you put calculate area, calculate perimeter in as an abstract method, meaning that it has no definition. And then for every class that you have an abstract method in, you have to make that class abstract. And what you're doing by making the class abstract is you are actually preventing the compiler from ever trying to create an object out of that class. So here we have an example from the Liang text, abstract class animal. If we ever said animal Bob equals new animal, it would throw an error. It would say, I cannot make an object from this abstract class. But what have you gained? Okay, you can't create objects of that class, but what have you gained? What you're doing is you're putting a, a restriction on anyone who might extend that class. So when I had the um, uh, generic shape, if I had made calculate area and calculate perimeter abstract, then in order for someone to make, say, the circle class, they had to put a definition in for calculate area, calculate perimeter, and it would be correct for the circle, assuming they did correct programming. And when someone extended it to a square, they have to put in a definition for calculate area, calculate perimeter. So they're going to overwrite these abstract methods. Why do you do this? Well, one of the things that's tough to, to get a handle on in a class, because it only lasts one semester, is the idea of software maintenance and software upgrades over time. We think of our software in class as lasting one semester, but think of your class lasting five years or your, your code lasting five years or 10 years or 20 years. And in the future, someone may want to extend that program that you wrote in a way that you've never thought about while you were writing it. So in the sheep sheepdog game, maybe someone wants to take that game two years from now and add wolves to it. Now the dog has to protect the sheep from the wolves. Well, that wasn't something we originally considered. But we do want the wolf to be able to play in the existing framework of the game. We don't want him to have to rewrite the whole game just to add wolves. 
Well, by requiring, what did we have in there? The move and the vocalized method, me methods. If we require that the wolf have a move and a vocalized, vocalized method, we've already provided a guideline and really a restriction by which someone could create a wolf and create the move and vocalized methods with the correct names, the correct term, uh, ter return types. So it will play in the larger game. So this is really about good software design, designing for expansion and designing um, for uh, maintenance of the code and improvement or upgrade of the code over time. And again, really tough to pull off in a one semester course, right? These are, these are issues that show up in year timeframes, multi-year timeframes. Okay, so if you have an abstract method, you must make the class abstract. If you have an abstract class, you cannot create an instance or an object out of that class. <clears throat> and so how do you tell the compiler that? You use the abstract keyword, just like you used it in the method. So the method, method here is public abstract string sound, and then the class becomes abstract class. By the way, I would add public to that still too, public abstract class animal. Uh, I'm using the Liang examples unedited, so um, we'll talk about what's, what's bad about them in terms of programming. Okay, so if a class contains an abstract method, it must be an abstract class. Everything else about it is just like you've already seen. You can have attributes, you can have methods that are not abstract, you can have methods that are fully defined, all of that works out fine. Uh, but you cannot, you cannot instantiate an object with the class. How does this work with inheritance? Well, an abstract class can have abstract children. So what does that mean? It means that the child also, maybe you had, uh, what did we have in, in, uh, in, uh, in the geometry one? We had calculate area, calculate perimeter. Maybe you extend it and you only do calculate area, but you don't do calculate perimeter. That's allowed. But then that, that shape that you, uh, that child class still has to be abstract. It has to be abstract because think about what happens if you tried to create an object of that class. If you created an object of that class, then somebody could call that method. And that's a dirty trick to play on the Java virtual machine. Hey, I need you to run this method and I haven't defined what it does yet. Right? That doesn't make any sense. So that's why you cannot create the objects. But you are allowed to do this chain of abstract classes. Um, in your projects, you, I doubt anyone will use an abstract class. You can, because you know I'm requiring inheritance and you could make your generic class abstract. There's nothing wrong with that. I really doubt anyone would need to do a chain of abstract classes, right? An abstract parent, an abstract child, and then a concrete child, or an abstract parent, abstract child, another abstract child, and then a concrete child. I don't think you, you're gonna have that much complexity in your projects, but be aware that that is possible. The abstract parent can also have the concrete children where they fully define all of the methods. And oddly enough, a concrete parent can have abstract children because remember when we, when we extend a class, we are allowed to add attributes and we're allowed to add methods. What if you added an abstract method to that child? You're allowed to do it, but you have to declare it as an abstract class. So what we're gonna see in the examples are uh, this, this notion of uh, abstract classes that have methods with no definition, just the signature. And then we extend it to children and then, and then implement those methods or fully define those methods using code. And then we can make an object of the child class. Closely related to that is the idea of an interface. Well, what's an interface? Interface is exactly what its name says it is. An interface is a boundary between two things. And it's the boundary by which they um, uh, either communicate or physically fit. That's the interface. So uh, many years ago when I was working in uh, space industry, uh, I worked for McDonnell Douglas and we were building satellite components and we were building this, this uh, power subsystem for satellites. It was a big box. It was like a 610 pound box. And inside that box were uh, batteries and avionics boxes, you know, power conditioning boxes, 
um, the data boxes. And so we were building the structure, which was just a honeycomb panel with um, inserts set in it by which you could the threaded inserts. So the boxes bolted to the honeycomb panel and the bolts went into the threaded inserts. And our inserts in the honeycomb panel were in a fixed pattern. And when the boxes, which were created by another company came to us, it had mounting feet also in a fixed pattern. And what do you know, the patterns matched. Well, obviously that's not a random event. How did that happen? Prior to production, we had to agree on an interface. We had an interface document that said, if you're gonna make a box for us, here's the whole pattern that you have to make your mounting feet fit. And the same is true for uh, the electrical cables. We had you know, big wire bundles routed all throughout this thing. And a wire bundle might have three or four wires in it, or it might have 50 wires in it. And they're connected also with connectors. You know, the two connector halves were made by the same company, so they always matched, right? But you took a, they, they had a bunch of holes in them. And what you would do is take a, a wire and shove it in one side with a pin on the end and have a wire on the other side with a cup on the end and the pin, pin and the cup would fit together. Well, if the wire going into a particular hole was supposed to measure temperature, the wire coming out of that particular hole probably should go to a temperature sensor. And again, there's 50 little holes in this connector. How do we know that when you, when you went into position number one for temperature, that you were hooking up with a uh, wire that led to a, uh, a thermometer, and also in hole number one? Well, interface documents. They're hugely important. They allow people in different companies to create products that then have to fit together and work. There are software interface. You know, this, it's not an accident that when you fire up your browser, it can connect with computers that it has never heard of before. Uh, everybody's using HTTP. What does that stand for? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Oh, okay. That's an interface. If you're going to play on the internet, you have to follow the internet protocols. And so these uh, interfaces are saying, you know, you're going to send certain message for to request data, then you're going to receive data in a certain format. These are all about interfaces. So what is an interface in the object oriented world? It's basically a list of methods, abstract methods that have to be incorporated. And why would you do that? Oh, okay, you've all heard of APIs. What is that abstract programmer interface? or application program or interface. Oh, the eyes for interface. Okay, so what an API tells you is someone's built a whole bunch of software and you're allowed to plug into it. But in order to plug into it, you have to meet the API requirements. And they're gonna tell you, okay, if you're gonna use our software, we have six different methods that you need to define. So basically they're saying, you, your software needs to incorporate these six different methods. And they'll tell you what the um, signature of the method is. Okay. They'll tell you what data they need and what return type they're going to get. And then you can create your own code with that interface. This is, this is what's happening here. You can create software and then say, okay, you are allowed to extend my software, but if you do so, here's my interface. And your interface is nothing more than a list of um, method signatures. And what you're saying is you're basically setting up a contract. You're basically saying, if you want to use my software, your software has to implement every one of these methods. Right now, they're abstract methods. They're just the signature with no definition. So if you want to use the software, you have to provide code for all of these. You can't do some. It's got to be all. So an interface is like a class file, public class, cheap, but it's public interface, whatever. It's like a class file, but it only has abstract methods in it. And it's really restricted in the use of attributes. Remember, classes are attributes and methods. Well, an interface is just abstract methods. 
and the only attributes you can have are constants. Why would they allow that? Well, they allow that so that you can, um, you might want to use constants inside of your <clears throat> abstract methods or, you know, when the methods are defined. You are not allowed to have normal attributes. So that's the thing with interface. It's called an interface. It's going to be interface dot, uh, still a dot Java file, but it's instead of saying class at the top, it says interface. And if you're going to implement it, you have to provide definition for all of the uh, abstract methods. What if you don't? What if you build a class that implements an interface, but it doesn't doesn't include all of the abstract methods? Well, by definition, that means that your class now contains an abstract method. That's okay. You just have to make it an abstract class. Eventually, all of them will have to be defined in order for you to create an object. So the Liang example, their interface is really simple. They have one abstract method. And again, public, abstract. So that's telling the Java compiler not to accept, ex expect any lines of code. Its return type is string. Its name is how to eat. It has no input parameters. And notice there's no curly brackets or anything. It's, that's just it. The signature followed by the semicolon. And then they have public uh, abstract class fruit implements edible. Now, why is, why is fruit still abstract? Because they didn't actually define the how to eat method. They're gonna do that later. They're gonna have apple extends fruit and they're gonna define how to eat. But notice the keyword is implements not extends. So in, when you're having classes, parent class, child class, and you're doing inheritance, then you use the word extends. Class A, class B extends class A. If you're doing an interface, it's class B implements interface A. Why are they different? You have to tell the Java compiler what to do. Remember, the, remember the, 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 the computer's as dumb as a box of rocks because it's a box of rocks. So you have to tell it everything. So you have to tell the compiler, look, you're going to be looking at an interface here, so don't be looking for the attributes. Don't be looking for completely defined methods. It's going to be all abstract methods. You can both extend and implement. In other words, extension is the inheritance, and then implementing is, is fulfilling the contract of the interface. You're allowed to do both. So here, in the, again, in the Liang text example, a chicken is an animal, therefore it extends animal, but it's also an edible animal, so it's gonna implement edible. And because chicken extends animal and implements edible, and remember animal was an abstract class, which had the method sound in it, so they have to define sound here on lines 27 through 29, and the edible interface had how to eat, and so on lines 20 through to 24, they have to put in a proper, definition for that method. Now chicken is not abstract and you can create an object of the class. So let's look at some examples of that. If we look at the code, here's the edible interface, public interface edible. So it's not class, it's interface. And once you say it's an interface, you really restrict it. You are not allowed to have any attributes unless they're constants. And more importantly, you're not allowed to have any methods. You're only allowed to put in these abstract methods. You're only allowed to have method signatures, no actual lines of code. And what you're doing is setting up a contract. If anybody ever wants to implement this interface, they have to define, fully define all of the methods. Now here, there's only one method but they have to provide a definition, lines of code, for how to eat. And then they have this other file where they test this thing, and let's go down to fruit. They do fruit, implements edible, and they keep it abstract. And it's abstract because notice what they don't do. They don't actually define the how to eat method. So they still have an abstract method on their hands. So they have class abstract, but once they extend it to apple, apple extends fruit. Well, fruit has that abstract how to eat method in it. Now apple has an abstract how to eat method in it. And therefore, because we don't want apple to be abstract, they actually define 
the method. And again, these are stupid, simple examples, so you get one line of code for your definition. And they extend it again with orange, same trick. Orange extends fruit, and they define how to eat. And because they're in different classes, you're allowed to define them different ways. That's the point of having these unique, uh, more, more precise and specific um, uh, child classes. Now, for animal, where am I? they have an abstract class animal. And again, it only has one abstract method in it, which is the sound the animal makes. Public abstract string sound. So it's got a return type of string. It doesn't take any input. Its name is sound. And it's abstract, meaning here there's no definition for it. So if we're going to create an animal, a real animal, uh, out of this generic animal class, we have to we have to implement that or code up that method. So there they go. Tiger class extends animal, and they have to provide a definition for the sound method. So they re, they provide a definition for the sound. And as I said before, you're allowed to do both. So here, chicken extends animal and implements edible. Therefore because of the animal class, they need to define what the sound is. And because of the edible interface, they need to define what the how to eat is. So they provide methods for both of those. And if we run this thing, Now you're allowed, like I said, you're allowed to do both. If we did both, by the way, this override line, optional. Made to the compiler, optional. It actually helps people reading it too. Assuming I have no typos. Oh, typo. Oh, it's sound. I needed to eat, how to eat. There we go. But I should spell it right. Did that do it? That did it. So you should play with these things. This is when I say play with these things. That's what I mean. Let's break it. I'm going to implement edible, but I'm not going to define the how to eat method. So when I compile, I just saved it. So when I compile, oh, tiger is not abstract and does not override the abstract method how to eat. So they're telling me right off the bat, look, you know, dummy, you, you have some abstract methods in here and you didn't define them. I could make tiger abstract. Where's my cursor? If I make tiger abstract, what's going to happen? Now I got a different problem because somewhere I created a tiger, right? I'm not allowed to make tigers. Oh, no, you're not allowed to do that. <clears throat> Tiger's an abstract class and you tried to make a tiger. Let's do it this way. I think actually, I think I, I think I did it out, out of order is what the problem was. Let's try that. Yeah. Look, tiger's abstract. Can't make a tiger. So when I say play with these codes, break it. You know, ask yourself, what if I did this? What if I did that? What would happen? Uh, 
you see is how quick it is to modify the code and and then always try to make sure that, that you bring it back to working condition. Okay, are there questions about abstract class in, and interface? Say you're making an array and like the type is the abstract class, but you filled it with like the actual realized child classes, would that work? Like say you made like an animal array and then you said like, animal zero equals new dog, would that work? You still would not be able to create an instance of that abstract class. What, what you're saying is somewhere in your abstract class, outside of that array, you have a method that's undefined. So you won't be able to create an, a method, an instance of that class. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. All right, now let's criticize the code. <laughs> so here's what they do. They create an array of objects and they fill it up with a tiger and a chicken and an apple and an orange. And then they go through the array and they just check, hey, is this edible? If it is, then do the how to eat method. And then, hey, is this an animal? If it is, then do the sound method. And if it's both edible and an animal like the chicken, then it gets both. Well, they're, they're doing some dirty tricks on you. First of all, how did you know this instance of was a real thing? Okay, now you know. Okay, this is the kind of thing that, again, tutorials and things help with. So uh, every object knows what class it is. So you can always query it and ask you, hey, what are you? Are you, are you an instance of edible? Are you an instance of animal? That kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't show up uh, that often. Notice, by the way, they had to cast the data type in order to make it work. But the cheaper trick is here. They create an array of objects. Where did this object class come from? How weird is that? Well, it turns out object is the highest level object in the chain of you know parent, child, parent, child, parent, child. And it turns out every object, or I should say every class that you create, even the ones you're creating for your homework and for your projects, they are automatically children of the object class, the generic object class. So I think that's kind of a cheap, uh, cheap trick to build that array that way. But that's why they have even this instance of, that's actually a property of the object class, but since every object you ever create is a child of the object class, uh, you have that access to that. So that's just uh, things that they don't explain in the code that, that might be confusing to students. Now, what about the code structure, which I hate? What do I hate about it? Take a guess. Is it that all the classes are made in like the same file? Yeah, so that has a separate class. Every class should have its own file. Don't create a bunch of classes in one file. Every class is, should be in its own file. Now, why did they do it? Well, they're not doing it to write good code. They're writing it to show a class example, and they've got some other constraints because of that. One constraint is they want it to be really, really short, and they want it to fit on a page of text in the book, and they want it to be in one little file so that you don't have to worry about one, two, three additional files. So they're just trying to they're just trying to make, make life easier from a, from a textbook writing standpoint, not from a good software writing standpoint. But yeah, every one of those classes should be in their own file. And more subtle, because they are in the same file, they didn't put public or private. They just said class or abstract class. And you should always 
say, public or private for your classes and for your attributes and for your methods. If you don't, then you get into a default mode. And unfortunately, there is not a standard default mode. So if you compile your code on one system and run it and then compile and run and run on another system, you may get different results based on what those different compiler creators thought was the default. It is open to interpretation. So basically you have an undefined status in terms of public and private. And of course, we never wanna leave anything undefined because computers are so stupid, we have to tell them everything. So even though these are in there, I would, I would still put in the, uh, the public in front of that. That's just code technique. As far as override goes, I don't know. I tend not to use that. I probably should. I don't know. <clears throat> it, it is a good visual reminder to someone reading the code that <clears throat> that's an override, overridden method. But it is optional. And of course, the actual methods are, you know, stupid simple because it's an example. Um, they do a similar thing here. They've got this generic object, abstract class, generic object, and <clears throat> uh, they pull in a um, date just to show off that they're doing something. And let's find the abstract class here. Let's see here, constructed geometric object, da, 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 return color, set a new color. Where's my, it's an abstract class. So sorry. There it is. Public abstract get area and get perimeter. And because it's a ge geometric object, they don't know. They, you know, we don't know how to do that. So down here in circle, if if circle is not abstract, and circle is not abstract, it, but it extends this abstract class. What does that tell you? You have to do the. Where is it? Get diameter, get, get area, there it is. Get area and get perimeter. And notice those are overridden methods. Those came from that generic parent. So if you're gonna make the concrete class, you have to define all the abstract methods. By the way, here's my complaint about this file. What's this, this? What the heck is this, this for? It's uh, so the radius used in that. It's like the input is radius, but then yeah. that radius gets overridden. Right, right, right. So the input is radius, and then you say radius equals radius. How does the, now you've got two radius. Yeah. Radius that's an attribute of this class and the radius that you've used as an input, a name of the input parameter. And now the poor Java virtual machine doesn't know what radius you're talking about when. So you say this dot radius, meaning, hey, I mean, this class's radius is equal to that other radius. You know, you can fix that by not naming this as radius. That's why I don't know if you've noticed whenever we're doing a, um, uh, whenever we do a getter, I always name this thing new radius. Now it's, now it's distinguished and I don't need the this. Uh, this is, uh, um, students tend to overuse that this uh, keyword. Uh, you generally don't need it. You know, the, the methods in this class know that if you're referring to an attribute value, you're referring to the attributes in this class. And if you're doing something that's so confusing that you need to tell the class what's going on, you may be confusing humans also. So you probably don't want to do that. Okay. And then they run, I'm not gonna run the code. You can run the code. You have access to this. It's on, it's on uh, line. Um, by the way, you notice I always run these things in, in a uh, uh, console. And based on the Discord comments about how much trouble Eclipse gives people, now you know why. 
Eclipse is too much power for what I need to do for this for these little demonstrations. So I run them in console. And my advice is if you're having trouble with something in Eclipse, run it in console, see if it works. And if it works, you truly have an Eclipse problem. And if it doesn't work, you have a coding problem. So you, you can always fall back to console as a, you're right, simpler is better sometimes. Now, having said that, Eclipse is a great tool. And as you get into more sophisticated software, it becomes more and more valuable to you. Uh, but uh, um, you, you see, I keep it simple here so that I don't get odd Eclipse issues coming out of the blue during class demonstrations. I get my own typos to mess me up. Okay, so that's the whole module. The rest of this week and the rest of the semester, all these times will be devoted to, I'll just be here in case people need to do some um, uh, tutorial stuff or workshop stuff. And when we do the demonstrations, I'll be doing demonstration, asking you to do your product demonstrations during these times. That's the P4, P5 and P6 deliverables. And I, as I said, each demonstration, each student, it takes about 10 minutes. They're good to sit in on uh, because seeing and hearing what other students are doing is always a good idea. Uh, you know, the more exposure you get to different people's ideas, the better you can figure out what works for your, uh, for your own projects, for your own homeworks. So that's how the rest of the semester goes. Do we have any questions about this topic, the abstract classes and interfaces? And again, my recommendation is to play with it. Then you'll have then you'll have questions. A lot of your questions you can answer to us by co code it up and run it. it. Takes you know ten minutes. But any questions? Okay. Um, then, are there any questions about the course, just in general? what's happening in the course. I'm gonna turn the recording off